So um, my name is Glenn Fajardo. I teach at the uh, Stanford D School. And the title of my talk is Stop Treating Technology Like a TV Dinner. Uh, I would have to say, like, the more I worked on this talk, the weirder and weirder it got. And so at a certain point, I just had to cut it off and say, OK, that's enough. Uh, but I, I wanted to first start with, I, I'm really pleased to be uh, joining you today, because uh, museums have been a part of my life since, uh, since I've been a little kid. Uh, whether it was like the Milwaukee Public Museum when, when I was in the first half of my childhood, the Ringling Museum in Sarasota, uh, or wherever I go in the world, you know, whether it's Mexico City, Helsinki, Bangkok, Buenos Aires, and of course San Francisco where I'm based, uh, museums have been um, so essential and will continue to be, so thank you for the work that you do. Okay, so um, I'm not going to give a yes and no answer to this, so, so, um, but the, the question on hand is, you know, can technology transform systems of power within culture and its institutions. I want to thank Christina for asking that question, because I think it's a really great question. But I'm not even going to answer that question. I'm, <laughs> what I'm going to do is uh, it made me think of another question, a related question, an adjacent question, because this is the adjacent panel. Like so, OK, so the, the question is, can we transform how we treat technology within our daily lives? How can we change our mindset around that? And then that got me to stop treating technology like a TV dinner. You might be thinking, what the heck does that mean? I will get to that. And you might be wondering, who, who is this guy? <laughs> he was making this sort of really random thing that's going on. Um, OK, so my name is Glenn. <laughs> we'll start with that. And uh, I've been focusing on how we might be creative together when we are far apart. And where that originated from is that I've collaborated with social change makers across six continents. And when you are working with social uh, change makers across six continents, you don't have the luxury of being able to fly around all over the place all the time. And so uh, really, it was from a fundamental need to have more human communication over time with people, to have deeper collaboration with people, and not to engage in what I call accidental colonialism. That is a topic for another, another day, uh, but that's something that's always been important to me. So, I've been uh, a student of distributed collaboration for 15 years. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, when I started, George W. Bush was the president of the US. That's how long ago it was. Um, Zoom was three years away from being founded. That's how long ago it was. I'm feeling really, really old. But, uh, but yeah, even, you know, like this is a, a, a picture from uh, a uh, class I did in 2017, long distance design, where we, we paired students from uh, Bangkok with students at Stanford. And, uh, with, and the, the, the friendships that came out of that was really crazy and nuts. And I was like, whoa, this is weird. OK, so uh, I believe that a, a designer's mindset is not just for designing new tech. Designing new tech is important, and we, we need people doing that. But it's also for how you can creatively use available technology for human connection. And I think that's particularly important in an increasingly AI-driven world. Uh, I teach. Uh, that's a long list of, <laughs> of classes that I've taught over the years. I, I've been part of the D-School um, uh, teaching community since 2014. Uh, classes include Design Across Borders, um, re the Reimagining Campus Life series. And uh, what I've been working on lately is uh, Design for Learning. Uh, last fall, we did Season 1, uh, Co-Designing Connection and Community. And this fall, we're hoping to do Season 2, uh, How Can We Use Generative AI to uh, Support Collaborative Learning. Uh, so really heady stuff, uh, working with uh, John Mitchell in computer science and uh, Jenny Asuna in the Graduate School of Education, both really awesome people. Uh, and I was a 2020 uh, D School Teaching Fellow. Um, I got kind of called into the house in March, and they were like, help! And I was just like, OK, sure, I, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And uh, I also write, uh, I co-wrote a book called uh, Rituals for Virtual Meetings with my, my friend Kershaw Bozank. Um, but I'm setting this up to say, like, um, I notice this contrast at the D School. And the D School is a really wonderful place. We help people develop their creative abilities through design. And those creative abilities can be used in whatever people decide to do. And uh, what I notice at the D School is this weird dichotomy where with analog things, with you know, the, the omnipresent Post-it and Sharpie, you know, for, for those of you who have been to, to workshops, it's, it's almost become a cliche. Um, People are like, yeah, let's get scrappy, you know, let's get creative, let's do this thing and that, and like oh, whiteboards, you know, like and anything physical, people are like very confident, right? But then when it comes to digital things, there's kind of like this, ah, it should just work, ah, like it's 
And, and I'm kind of like, I'm all for usability. I'm all for like really great design, but you know, you, you hear these things like, ah, not another tool, like, ah, I'm not a tech person, or like, or screens are the enemy. That's, that's for sad. Uh, there's, uh, you know, screens are the enemy, or if only technology was better, or uh, you know, the latest, like AI is gonna destroy creativity, which is actually a, a good question, but that's, we'll, we'll get into that. So I think the answer is not a weird picture. This was actually taken in front of a museum. Bonus points if you can tell which museum this is. Kind of hard to tell. But uh, the, the, the answer I think is, is here, uh, or sorry, here, here, is the idea of this kind of low-res scrappy thinking when it comes to digital technology. Like it is things that we have the power to manipulate and kind of use in clever and creative ways ourselves. It's not necessarily an app that has to be built by somebody else, but it's something that we can do. So what if we change the way that we look at technology? What if we stopped expecting technology to do all the work for us, okay? What if we stop treating technology like a TV dinner? Okay, here's the, here's the big reveal. So with a TV dinner, you basically press one button and you're done, right? It's kind of you press one button and you're done. There's no work, it's super convenient. You don't put any of yourself into it, right? And your results may vary from what's advertised. <laughs> but, but what if instead that we treated technology as one ingredient of many? that we can mix and match with like different things, like with, with, with maybe even a little bit of humanity, <laughs> like for, for that matter. Uh, but the, the idea is that we're not relying on kind of somebody else's app that they built, but that we are active participants in how technology is used. What if we stop making technology the protagonist of the story, right? So think back to like the Arab Spring and like it was called the, the Facebook revolution. And that, that just drove me nuts at the time thinking, I mean, it's, I think it was a really interesting story from and there, uh, a key enabling factor, but that was, that was um, a story of people, not, not of technology to me. What if the tool wasn't the hero of the story, right? Um, what if we made humans the subject instead of the object? Because if you look at the way stories of technology are told, what's the subject? The subject is often the, tech, the technology, right? It's not the people uh, that are using the technology. So what if we made non-tech humans the subject? So just to be clear, this is not a story about um, Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. No, no, I'm not trying to dog on either one of them, but that's, that's not what I'm talking about. So if you look at the history of technology, new tech often dis uh, inspires two very different thoughts. It's either like wild techno-optimism, like this is, gonna, this is gonna change everything. Uh, it, that's, that's a phrase that I, could, I could wish I could hear less, but um, it, even when it's true. Uh, and then the other reaction is kind of like, oh, this is the worst thing ever. This is like the end of the world. You know, this is like, this is the end of the world. And you know, we're seeing, we saw it with social media, we're seeing it with AI, but this is a pattern very deep in history. So if you look at books, when books came out, it was a while ago. Um, I don't know what version we're on now. Um, but when books came out, there was kind of this dichotomous reaction of like, oh, this will solve education, right? That's kind of the wild optimistic end. And then there's also a, a, a very strong school of thought like, books are terrible. They're gonna make people so socially isolated, they're not even gonna lift their head up from their book because they're gonna be immersed in their book. And it, it sounds funny, but it's true, right? And then so this idea of people having their heads buried in their phones, we think it's this brand new thing. It's not, like there's something about the historical rhymes of technology over time. Um, I think it's also important to remember that technology use is not natural. There's, everything is invented, right? So when, when I pick up the phone, um, I pick up the phone and I say hello, and we think of this as like a natural thing that we do. That is not natural. Like, that was invented at one point. So Thomas Edison uh, said, oh, when the phone was invented, when you pick up the phone, you gotta let people know that you're listening and we're gonna say hello. And back then, interestingly, hello did not, wasn't a greeting. The older meaning of hello is like the Sherlock Holmes meeting. Hello, what do we have here? Kind of thing. So then people were like, I don't know why Edison was like, yeah, let's use the word hello to answer the phone. That's really weird. And Alexander Graham Bell, his, his contemporary said, oh yeah, we definitely need to say something when we pick up the phone, but we should say ahoy which in a weird way actually made more sense, right? But that, that thing that we take for granted as being a natural thing was invented at some point. 
we invent the use of technology, and we have the power to change that, that use. Um, so what if we had a compass uh, to, to navigate how we use technology that people could use, whether it was in 2023 or 2033 or 2053 or 1853, you know, like what, what would that compass look like? So I'm working on this, uh, but I thought it'd be more fun to show examples of what we can do with this mindset. And uh, I'm gonna focus on, I, I, I feel like I wrote this chalk for Zeb, like but this, is, this is really weird, but like one question I've, I've been focused on since uh, 2020 is why do some screens fatigue while other screens intrigue? And so I remember this very visceral conversation with a friend of mine, and I think it was in March of 2020, and this is like when sort of like peak social isolation pandemic, and he said like, it's like, Glenn, I'm like so tired, like I have so much screen fatigue, I've been on Zoom calls for eight hours today or something like that. And I said, oh, that's, you know, that's really terrible. Um, you really need to get some rest, uh, as, as we're talking on a Zoom call, which is kind of funny. Um, and I asked him, like, what are you going to do to take it easy tonight? Because you really need to do something to get some rest. And he said, oh, I'm just going to chill and watch Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, never mind. <laughs> but you can kind of see that contradiction, right? And so it's really interesting when you start getting curious about technology and kind of digging into this. And there's a longer story behind this, behind uh, sort of curiosity, chunking, and cuts that I, that I won't get into in this talk. But we, we use these principles in kind of doing uh, different things like at, in, in classes that I do at the D school. So one question we could ask is, what if students from different parts of the world could see parallels and differences in their everyday lives without having to use language to communicate. And this kind of originated from one thing that I noticed in, in international collaboration work where uh, no matter how dedicated people are, there's always a subconscious bias about how well somebody speaks the language of interaction, usually English. And I thought, like, what if the first interaction didn't involve any language at all? How could we do that? And it was like, oh, what we can do is like, we have these cool affordances where people have, you know, have these, these, these phones and they can like, take pictures and videos. So what happened was students would take pictures and videos of a 24-hour period of their life, and then they would have a conversation, a first conversation, entirely through those photos and videos. And it's the idea is like the, the, you always relate to the last thing that was said. And it looks something like this. And so that's like their initial conversation. And from there, they would talk. And they had a starting point that was, uh, um, interestingly, a little bit more equal, right? But they also saw kind of these, these parallels and differences. Now, if you extend this a little bit, imagine if a young person uh, who went to MAP and a young person who went to ACMI had a conversation through the photos and videos that they took through those th two museums. Like what kinds of exchanges could we, we inspire in that? And, and again, the point here is, this is not like a new app being built. This is just being kind of clever with, with the technology that you have available to you. So what if we made students the heroes of their own learning journeys? So like, how could we do that? Like, I, you know, I, I really believe that you wanna make students the protagonists of their own story. So, um, oh, here we go.
so like every every class was like an episode of a story. And, and this isn't just to kind of make it more entertaining, but it's actually to put students into that narrative and to provide that narrative stru uh, structure within a class. So what if we extend that to like, uh, what if a course was a reality TV show with story arts for both the individual episodes and the season as a whole? What would la that look like? Well, it might look something like this, where we're looking at the end of the season. How helpful the empathy map was. Understanding the resources that I have in times of uncertainty. Okay, so uh, again, like, as you can tell, I'm not a very good video editor <laughs> like that. But the idea here is there, there are these things that we can do if we kind of tap into like the technologies that are available. And one thing that's exciting about um, kind of what's happening with AI is this kind of video editing is gonna be increasingly accessible to everyone. I can just say, actually, this is my dream. It's like, okay, make a video, 60 seconds, show all of our students, you know, put a funky track down, like whatever and it puts it down, but it's, it's the imagination of how to use it. So uh, again, like what if we had a compass to navigate how we use technology that people could use, uh, whether it's video calls today or holograms tomorrow or direct mind transfer someday, that path can be illuminated by the ways of the designer with uh, things like empathy, noticing experimentation and play. And it's really about uh, um, getting curious in about two things. Like one is getting curious about how human connection works and the nuances around that and then getting curious about what the affordances of technology are, regardless of what that technology is in your time and era. Uh, so participate in new answers, I encourage you to play, to notice an experiment, try something different, maybe something even weird. Stop treating technology like a TV dinner and uh, start uh, participating in cooking up your own uses of technology. Thank you. <laughs>